So I thought I would make a first of hopefully a series of videos delving into both political science as well as political philosophy, where the aim is to explore several political strains of thought from an academic-based perspective. I will start off by giving a brief overview of the ideology pertaining to anarchism in this video. We're actually keeping in line with my movie analysis video. The current video should also be of aid as to when I start making videos concerning the Dune franchise. As throughout the Dune books, there is an overt criticism of religions, governments, and institutions focusing in on their inherent danger, very much keeping in line with anarchist thinking in some respects. It's of course a given that I will not be able to cover all aspects of the subject matter, but I should also add the additional caveat that much of the perspectives put forth in this video may not necessarily be representative of all currents of anarchism. This is again due to the fact that anarchism expresses a plethora of opinions, and given its anti-authoritarian bent, it's only natural that claiming primacy to a strict set of unmalleable political prescriptions would very much not be in keeping with the traditions of anarchism. In addition, I will here focus on the essentially 19th century political movement or classical anarchism as it's sometimes referred to, and not address the more recent 20th century historical development of anarcho-capitalism or voluntarism as it's also called in order to distinguish itself from that of mainstream anarchism. I might however make a video in the future where I address this ideological variant which is heavily tied to that of the work of Murray Rothbard and other 20th century figures and which holds an inherently right-wing position as opposed to the radical left-wing ideology of anarchism. We can start our journey into anarchism by describing the political movement as an ideology which concerns itself with achieving a classless, stateless, and essentially non-hierarchical society where there might arise tolerable hierarchical relations such as that of the deferment to authority in the case of a student-teacher relationship or that which would seem to just about everyone as a justified intervention in the case of saving a baby from drowning. These justified hierarchical exceptions would nonetheless have to be clearly justified and based upon voluntary consensus from a societal perspective. Anarchists also, in general, hold a very emancipatory and developed notion of freedom where citizens living in a state of anarchy would be free from political domination and economic exploitation, where there would exist a bond of solidarity between its citizenry and thereby further cultivating a mutual respect for the interests of all. The means given here of ending the before-mentioned political domination and economic exploitation is found traditionally in anarchism through the strategies of direct action and other non-governmental actions. Direct action can be described as by Rudolf Rocker, more on him later in the video, as an action performed through, as he puts it, the instruments of economic power which the working class has at its command, or in a more general fashion, as actions keeping in line with anarchist philosophy which are designed to provoke a reaction from that of the state. These strategies have then been held in the alternative or direct opposition to both electoral means using the legislative power of the state, as well as that more specifically vanguardism as practiced and developed through the Bolsheviks. A natural consequence of this is that anarchists have often historically abstained from voting, but more importantly the emphasis of anarchism has always been, as previously mentioned, uh, that of abstaining from the utilization of state power by a political party claiming to represent working class interests as the road to socialist transformation. I here use the term socialist deliberately as to quote Adolf Fischer, every anarchist is a socialist but not every socialist is necessarily an anarchist, i.e. anarchists affirm the position of socialists that the means of production should be owned collectively but anarchists also hold positions which may not necessarily be shared by socialists such as the riddance of the state without a direct reformist involvement of a vanguard party. Finally then, we are then ready to give a tentative suggestion of a definition of anarchism, although as it's difficult to account for all differing views held, uh, we still here try to define anarchism as a political theory which concerns itself with the achievement of a classless, stateless society free from all forms of hierarchical control, where its citizenry are free to cooperate as equals. As a small side note, there are certainly in existence much broader definitions of anarchism, such as the one given by Noam Chomsky, for instance, 
where he has defined anarchism in the past in terms of giving an onus for Westing authority in some rather than others. This last definition is again directly related to that of justifying hierarchical relations. We also mention here another definition from anarchist and anthropologist David Graeber, who liked to emphasize anarchy as something you do rather than something you believe in, where he defined anarchism in terms of an ethical discourse about revolutionary practice. However, a shortfall of these definitions may be seen as suffering from a critique of too wide of an applicability and at worst to constitute more general truisms revealed under scrutiny for some. Now, before we start discussing some of the major tenets of anarchism, it can be helpful to get a historical overview of its developments, which is both particularly and directly tied to that of 19th century political developments. That is not to say, however, that one cannot find earlier references, such as from the etymological origins of the word anarchy, finding its root from that of the ancient Greek anarchia, meaning something like lack of leader, where we might also mention the noun anarchos, taken to mean rulerless. One can furthermore find some loosely anarchistic themes stemming from ancient Greece, with that of the earliest pre-Socratics of philosophers, who were early examples to formalize an opposition to notions such as authority, traditional religious beliefs, and a further skepticism concerning that of rulers. More specifically, we can also mention Sino's Republic, which can be seen in opposition to the perhaps most known philosophical text of all time, namely that of Plato's Republic. Although, sadly, this work is currently not survived in its entirety, there does, however, exist reliable secondary sources where we find snippets such as quotes and paraphrases. Sino's Republic can thus be seen in relation to the movement of Stoic philosophy, of which Sino of Siditum was an active contributor, and where he himself placed great emphasis in terms of living a life of virtue. The work can thus be seen in terms of political philosophy as concerning an ideal state where building on the school of the cynics, a great emphasis was placed on freedom, as this was directly correlated to that of the good of man, where freedom is only gained through freedom, according to Zeno. The connection to anarchism in Zeno's Republic can thus be seen through the more overt criticisms of the omnipotence, protection, and control of the state, where focus is instead placed in the direct hands of men themselves, where each man must govern himself. In relation to the modern movement of anarchism, this criticism fits in line nicely with the strong emphasis placed within anarchism to be exempt from arbitrary domination and the superstructure constituted as the state, which again anarchists consider to form a symbiotic relationship with that of capitalism. Another early reference to anarchism, or proto-anarchism if you will, is seen in that of the East Asian religion of Taoism, were the Tao being constituted of something which cannot be directly described, or in other words, constitute the formless, where a natural order is emphasized. Some have interpreted this natural order in terms of placing an emphasis instead on the non-coercive or voluntary action. However, there may be problems within anarchism concerning this notion of the natural order as anarchists do not unify around one particularly worked out potential future society, for obviously there will arise multiple candidates stemming from different strands of thought within the movement. This was also articulated early on according to anarchist thinking in the 19th century with the opposition to Fourierism, which emphasized a much more fully worked out society. Furthermore, I suppose anarchists are not as optimistic that they have a fully articulated, worked out conception of the self already figured out although I suspect there certainly will lie sympathy in relation to the emphasis placed within Taoism of that of aspiring to the egoless, which certainly in terms of solidarity has been strongly emphasized, historically speaking. There is also the congruence within anarchism with that of being both wary and questioning of excessive wealth, where the entailment for anarchists is that of mass wealth inequality seen in society. As an example, we may hear, for instance, quote that of the founder of Taoism, namely Lao Tzu, in his Tao Te Ching, uh, one translation, where he writes that searching for precious goods leads astray. From the previous section, then, it's clear that there exists at least a commonality in some shared criticism, as well as sharing a non-coercive vision of man, i.e. having a strong placement 
upon the liberty conditions for citizens within a society, this may further be extrapolated upon when we consider commonalities and philosophical views regarding human nature, but I will not go into further discussion on this point here. I have, however, left a link in the description to an article which details this point, emphasizing the transcendence of the egoistic self found within Taoism, which may be complementary to some notions found within anarchism throughout its history and its, in its opposition to what famed anarchist Murray Bookchin called personal egotists who identify freedom with entrepreneurship and profit. We may here begin our discussion on the earliest direct references to the concrete or political movement of anarchism which can be directly tied to that of the French Revolution with the group of political dissidents referred to as the Enraché or alternatively the ultra-radicals, banded around central themes such as Jacques Roux, a radicalized French priest, and Jean Vallée, this political fraction disseminated ideas such as popular democracy, suspicion of political organizations, as well as that of individuals and direct action. The latter included advocating for more direct measures such as that the provision that the government provide work and necessary means for the poor, Although the group did not label themselves as directly anarchist, it was nonetheless a label attributed to them by the opposing much larger political group known as the Jacobins. We can thus label the Enragé in many ways as that of a precursor movement to that of anarchism on the basis of the anarchist-like tendencies found within the movement. It's also interesting to note that the term anarchism was used in a defamatory manner early on, in which much of the connotation to the negatively association of the word still survives to this day, where anarchism is directly tied to that of chaos and disorder. So often, in fact, that we find this very common practice still today among dictionary usages. This was also to be espoused by many political adversaries throughout the ideological development, including notable figures such as the famed conservative Edmund Burke, who in turn associated anarchy with that of injustice and disorder. Much of this negative attribution can also be seen in conjunction with the late 19th century anarchist tactics summarized under the heading of the propaganda of the deed, which I will briefly touch upon later in this video. More direct developments of the movement are profusely seen in relation to the movement in the 19th century, were much both of the underpinnings as well as that of the intellectual developments in anarchism take place. We may, for instance, start our discussion with that of Pierre Joseph Proudhon, who was the first to declare himself that of an anarchist and who, despite his disappointingly dated misogynistic positions held at the time, did much for the development of anarchism both as an ideology and an intellectual movement, with various writings and contributions, perhaps most famously in his advocacy of mutualism, which served as both a philosophy and economic theory. Seen in economic terms, mutualism envisions a society based upon free markets, where often, as in the case for Proudhon, involves a mutual credit bank which has the ability to lend money to producers at a minimal interest rate in a way that redevelops the overarching profit motive found within capitalist banking with that of maintaining an interest rate sufficient to cover only the administrative costs. One may also view mutualism as a form of market socialism, although a version not involving state socialism where the means of productions are determined not by individual or collective property, but that of possession based upon the person performing the work, which ties into a concept of limited real right within property rights known as usufruct. For completeness sake, I also give here the much reproduced affirmation of the position of anarchism given by Proudhon himself in, I believe his work, What is Property?, here reproduced from George Woodcock's Anarchism, A History of Libertarian Ideas and Movements. What is to be the form of government in the future? he asks. I hear some of my readers reply, why? How can you ask such a question? You are a Republican. A Republican, yes, but that word specifies nothing. Res publica, that is the public thing. Now, whoever is interested in public affairs, no matter under what form of a government, may call himself a Republican. Even kings are Republicans. Well, you are a Democrat. No, then what are you? I am an anarchist. Returning to mutualism, the contributions within mutualism are important, as they can be seen along with both collectivism and anarchist communism, or anarcho-communism, 
to synthesize the three most common and perhaps by extension most prominent economic theories found within anarchism, anarchist communism in terms of economics differs most from the two previous anarchist economic theories in that under this system, coordination through market means is totally rejected, where instead an emphasis is placed upon economic planning and further coordination through workers' associations. Collectivism, in turn, can be seen in some ways as a hybrid between mutualism and anarchist communism, in that it accentuates both a distribution according to needs for essential goods and services, combined with an openness to monetary exchanges in relation to workers' self-management. However, it should be stressed here that common to all these differing economic theories was an emphasis placed upon, to quote Lucien van der Waalt, the establishment of a stateless, classless society based on the socialization of the means of production, workers with self-management and economic coordination from below. Note also that somewhat confusingly, these separate domains of economic theories are not as separate as one should think as the theories have been practiced alongside each other, as was done for example during the Spanish Revolution taking place during the Spanish Civil War of 1936 to 1937. This was also affirmed by anarchist theorists such as Rudolf Rocker, who was very much in line with free experimentation when it came to the implementation of these systems. He also had an evolutionary system of thought in regards to the representation of anarchy. We may therefore say that the different economic theories can be seen to be intertwined together in their shared goal of creating a new social structure based upon self-management and decision-making following strictly from a bottom-up approach within an anarchist society. In a more general sense, this sort of amalgamation of differing ideas found within anarchist thought is very common for the movement. It can thus seem very confusing for the novice reader when first encountering the many labels concerning subsets of anarchist thought or theory such as anarcho-syndicalism, anarcho-communism, anarcho-feminism, green anarchism, anarcho-transhumanism, etc. To learn that the ideas are very often both complementary to each other as well as learning that the people holding such positions very often espouse a multiple identification with the many different strands of thought found within anarchism. As an example, it would be very common for an anarchist to say share concerns with both that of anarcho-syndicalism as well as that of anarcho-communism. And we may even state that the two are in some sense conjoined, which will become more apparent after we give some preliminary descriptions of the two positions. Anarcho-syndicalism, although having somewhat earlier roots, developed as a late 19th century movement where highest prominence was attained in the beginning of the 20th century, were central to the aims of the movement through that of class struggle was the formation of labor unions as an antithesis or battleground to the framework of capitalist development. We may thus view anarcho-syndicalism as an adoption essentially of an anarchist strategy with the long-standing aim of facilitating a post-capitalist society through the realization of anarchism where worker control of society through the use of labor unions facilitates a collectively organized society. We may thus see syndicates or unions as the formation of a framework in which workers are organized along the lines of gaining both skills to combat employees as well as that of being in possession of techniques to assume direct control of the working environment. We may also state that central in anarcho-syndicalism's aims to accomplish a collectively organized society is also the implementation of socialist production, where common collective production ensures the meeting criteria of the common public's needs. For more reading in anarcho-syndicalism, I recommend reading perhaps the most famous of the leading writers of anarcho-syndicalism, namely that of the German anarchist writer and activist Rudolf Rocker and his seminal work Anarcho-Syndicalism, Theory and Practice. Now to delve into anarcho-communism, which can be seen in opposition to that of the statist iteration of communism practiced initially by the Bolsheviks following the successful 1917 revolution that occurred in Russia, which subsequently morphed into the now historically famous Soviet Union. The anarcho-communists, like all anarchists, thus rejected the structure of the state, but maintained the idea of creating a future society through the creation of a classless commonwealth, or in the case for the anarchist variant, in opposition to any status notion of communism, the product of social labor is collectively owned 
and there is a crystallized opposition to any notion of socialism being introduced by a small minority, we have already briefly discussed the economic position of anarcho-communism, but I will here supplement the important feature that while social ownership of property is a strongly weighted feature within this line of thought, both personal property as well as collectively owned items, goods and services are also respected and have been so historically. We might also here mention that of the famous writer, activist and scientist of Kropotkin, who can be seen as a co-founder of this political philosophy along with Enrico Malatesta and Rudolf Rocker, and who wrote extensively both in regards to a critique of capitalism, feudalism, as well as giving political prescriptions for the attainment of a future society under conditions of greatly lessened inequality, as well as that of scarcity. His most famous book, but perhaps not the best introduction to anarchism, is given in his book The Conquest of Bread from 1892, in which he advocates for a future society containing a decentralized economic system in which collective ownership is held of both intellectual and useful property. From the previous descriptions of anarcho-syndicalism and anarcho-communism, it should now be clear that it's both possible and indeed was practiced to have a conjunction of anarcho-syndicalism with that of anarcho-communism, making it possible to identify with both strains of thought if one wishes to do so. Here, the former may take the aim as a strategy with the aim of moving towards a post-capitalist world, while the latter details a specific vision or political philosophy for that post-capitalist society taking the form of an anarchist society. A more clear distinction of terms, and which I also find helpful when referencing diverse thinkers within anarchism, is that of social versus individualist anarchism. I will also subsequently introduce the distinction iterated in the book Black Flame from 2009, which distinguishes that of mass anarchism with insurrectionist anarchism in terms of anarchist tactics or strategy in order to achieve a revolutionary change in society. First, touching upon social anarchism, which by far comprises the largest and thereby dominant portion of the ideology, this branch of anarchism stresses the importance of both communal applications within society, as well as that of cooperative aspects found in anarchist theory. It is then no surprise that far more emphasis has been placed upon political struggles and large-scale conflicts historically within social anarchism. The main impetus of this video has also been given in terms of social anarchism, which includes the economic theories and notable people discussed, with the possible exception of Proudhon, and which because of its dominance typically has been referred interchangeably with that of just the label anarchism. Individualistic anarchism, on the other hand, places a greater deal of attention, not surprisingly, on the individual and American viewers might be familiar with this strain of anarchism, at least incidentally through the works of famed American naturalist Henry David Thoreau and his famed book Walden. Within this philosophy, more emphasis is placed, or one may say that the term freedom is taken in a more extreme measure to include any power over the individual will and freedom to act, thereby essentially excluding the popular collective organizational power so central to that of the opposing social anarchism. This vantage point, by making the individual the focus of attention instead of that of the communities, has seen less application in real life than that of social anarchism, and much of the output has been through theoretical and philosophical treatments, although it has seen greater emergence within the United States, perhaps due to the ideological leniency of individualism, which has had a profound impact on the political landscape as well as that of policies in this country when compared to other continents such as Europe. The challenge for individualistic anarchism seems then to be that of the construction of a society along the lines of individual personal choices and to defend the primacy of freedom and liberty understood along the terms espoused for this group of anarchists. In terms of distinguishing mass anarchism with that of interactionist anarchism in the facilitation of revolutionary change, we note that as perhaps the name of the first term implies, mass anarchism relates movements in terms of masses and has been seen historically to comprise the majority held position in contrast to the latter term. Mass anarchism adheres to the fact that mass movements are quintessential for bringing about revolutionary change in society, where this strategic approach places importance on mass participation in the effect of transformations involving immediate reforms 
or other political decisions and factors. Taking the counterposition, insurrectionist anarchism claims all reforms are illusory and therefore not worth pursuing where emphasis is instead placed upon armed action or other insurrectionist tactics in order to bring about a spontaneous revolutionary current or event. This later tactic has been associated with the former propaganda by the deed, which initially arose during the late 19th century, lasting into the early decades of the 20th century. This movement is associated with armed insurrectionist tactics, such as bombs and assassinations, and were seen as highly controversial at the time, which applies also within the movement, as early supporters such as the prominent anarchist theoretician Enrico Malatesta also levied a heavy critique against implementations of these tactics, choosing at a later period to advocate for other tactics such as syndicalism. Nonetheless, much of the association of anarchism, that of chaos and disorder, can be in large part attributed to the historical usage of the tactic propaganda of the deed, which even saw an American president assassinated. We may close off the historical portion of this video, where we briefly discuss more recent developments within anarchism taking place from the second half of the 20th century with the work of anarchist and social theorist Murray Bookchin, who had a somewhat ambivalent relationship with anarchism through the years, choosing at one point to no longer label himself as that of an anarchist following a falling out of sorts within anarchist groups. Bookchin's contributions to anarchism are often labeled in terms of his input to placing strong emphasis on ecology and environmental issues stemming from the 1950s when very few others were addressing such issues, where we again find Bookchin addressing such issues such as pollution and the associated problems of chemicals and foods at a very early juncture in time in relation to the modern ecological movement. In this way, he was quite the pioneer stemming from the fact that most of the more prominent cultural support and zeitgeist for ecological issues came later at the start of the 60s with the publication of Rachel Carson's Silent Spring over the work of other popularizers such as Alan S. We may thus view Bookchin's work in light of the branch of anarchism mentioned earlier, which is known as green anarchism, although I point out here that Bookchin distances himself very much from another green anarchist movement known as anarcho-primitivism which I will not address in this particular video. Green anarchism conjoins anarchism with that of both ecology and environmental issues where, according to Bookchim himself, capitalism is not capable of dealing with the ongoing climate crisis, giving rise again to the impetus of thinking along lines of new social structures in society. Of course, the challenge here for Bookchim, if he believes the same will hold true for all hierarchical societies, is to establish that these hierarchical orderings of society are in such misalignment with placing the necessary emphasis on nature that such concerns as global warming become inevitable. There does, for example, exist earlier highly hierarchical societies such as the ancient Egyptians, which had a rather benign impact on nature, which proponents of Bookchin will have to tackle. Bookchin, following the early 50s, would later update his thinking, much along the lines of 1960s utopic thinking, which emerged during this period with corresponding essays where he advocated a view which came to be developed as social ecology, very much sympathetic to automation and cybernation, replacing what he saw as a realm of necessity with that of a realm of freedom. The implementation of this can be seen in terms of a fusion synthesis with that of anarchism where technology is used as a liberatory element in urbanization conjoined with an envisioned classless decentralized society where decisions are made at a horizontal playing field through the means of direct democracy where there exists immediate callback of local elected representatives such as those elected through various local neighborhood assemblies of free citizens. There is also the governance aspect in relation to surroundings where through his developed theory of social ecology there would be necessitated a symbiotic relationship between that of the ecological and that of social issues. Lastly, Bookchin may be seen in a wider development of modern anarchism, where there is a greater breakage with the notion of economic emancipation through the inherent wage labor versus capital struggle on the road to anarchist revolution, and instead more emphasis is placed fundamentally on the emergence of hierarchy and domination. This is also in conjunction with place or a greater understanding on solidarity, which Bookchin espouses trumps that of status or class interests. 
On a final note, we briefly mentioned the earlier mentioned late anarchist David Graeber, who is perhaps most known for his participation of the Occupy movement and for coining the phrase we are the 99%. Moreover, he has written extensively on subject matters related to anarchism and was also interested as an extension of his academic training as an anthropologist with that of early state formations in history, although I will not go into more detail on that work here. In summation, we have then, in this brief introduction to anarchism, looked much at the historical development of anarchism, some economic theories held within the movement, and some differing positions held within the ideology. As a large portion of this video has taken the presence of anarchist history, I will here split the video into two videos at the very least, where I will at a later time address specific historic practices of anarchism, as well as discussing more positions held within the ideology pertaining to both feminism as well as that of looking at some contributions within philosophy of law, with an emphasis on morality and justice. I will also dedicate a substantial portion to criticism, as I want to look at counter-arguments for whichever political philosophy I address in my videos. Detailing specific practices and examples will also help facilitate the current status of anarchism as a whole, and give more the image of anarchism being tied with that of a very much alive and breathing movement, which will again be of topical interest to some, I hope. I have left sources in the description where some of these sources are a great entry point, in my opinion, of getting into the ideology of anarchism for those interested.